All right. Four ten, eight four seven. Yeah, that's right. Somebody. Hello, Jim. I was beginning to think I might be all alone this time. I'll hold your hand. I heard it. Yeah, okay, good. Well, I, I was just pondering what to do if nobody showed up at all. <laughs> anyway, it's a risk with such a small class. So where are you from, Jim? Idaho. Ah, which school? Idaho State. Okay. I've never been there. My mom grew up there. Oh, I've been to Coeur d'Alene years ago. That's a different state. Is that, I thought it was. I guess I'm wrong. Is that Washington? Well, no, Coeur d'Alene is northern Idaho, but it is very closely interfaced with Washington, Oregon. It's it's the bedroom community for uh, people in Washington, Oregon. Ah, okay. It's their playground, Coeur d'Alene is. Ah. Well, I usually do when waiting for people is look at the news. And I think there was this big scare about WPA2 that came out, the crack vulnerability. I suppose you heard about that one. With Wi-Fi? Yeah. You haven't updated your web? Yeah, that, that you can get into the uh, WPA2 with a details that aren't yet disclosed. It didn't seem that important to me, but I never trusted that stuff anyway. The one that actually I thought was more important was this one. Uh, there is some also not yet specified vulnerability in um, public key encryption with these devices. They use a certain library for RSA, and there's 700,000 ID cards in another country based on this. It's some kind of faulty design of the TPM, so that means some Microsoft bit lockers are vulnerable. So this will be coming out in a couple of weeks with the details, but uh, almost a million vulnerable keys uh, that are somehow predictable and crackable, although they say it's not as simple as a flaw in the random number generator. Interesting. Hello, DC. I don't know your full name, but I see you there. I think I'll wait till 10 after, another three minutes, and then we'll go on with however many people show up. 
We got anything else fun? Uh, good, we got somebody else here. Dermis, hello Dermis. I guess you have the microphone, eh? Anyway, I can see your chat, that's good. And uh, I say I'll wait till 10 after, which is about three more minutes, and we'll carry on with whoever shows up there. Uh, what else is fun? This one, this one was kind of interesting. I've got, um, so PolitiFact, which is some website, got infected with JavaScript-based malware. Ah, KT's here. Hello. And um, they were mining Monero with it. So apparently the amount of processing that you can get done with JavaScript running your CPU up to 100%, at least these guys thought that would be enough to uh, make money mining cryptocurrencies. I've got some students that want to try mining cryptocurrencies to make money for the hacking club. And uh, maybe they're going to try it. I don't know. They put it into my Bitcoin and I told them not to bother because you can't make any money on that. But maybe you can make money on Monero. And this was pretty good. There's now, there was a Go engine, I think a year ago, that beat all human players at Go and artificial intelligence. And now it has become even smarter with no human interaction. So this is sort of like the science fiction dream of AIs that don't need us at all anymore, not even to program them or train them. <coughs> This may be the post-human future. Anyway, I think Elon Musk is worried about that. And if you're interested in cryptocurrencies, uh, here's a well-stated explanation of a well-known problem. Uh, Bitcoin is largely a failure. It succeeded as a store of wealth that hasn't been hacked, but it failed in its actual primary goal, which was to make a currency that could not be controlled by any government because uh, it's almost all controlled by China, because no one else has cheap enough uh, electricity to compete with them. So that means the government of China can completely control Bitcoin if they want to. Uh, if anyone is controlled more than 51% of the 51% or more of the miners, then they can outvote everybody else and basically steal their money. There's a variety of attacks that are known in Bitcoin, and they're supposed to not happen because it's supposed to be globally distributed, but that's not what happened. So. Anyway, he explains how the Chinese government could uh, easily commit a form of fraud called double spending and steal the money from Bitcoin. Nobody's done that yet, but it certainly does appear like the government of China could do it if they wanted to. And that kind of messes up the concept of Bitcoin. It was supposed to make that impossible. Anyway, I think we're about up to the time here. So here's the schedule. We're up to chapter three. All the old videos are up here. Uh, chapter three is kind of short. These next ones are kind of long, but they don't easily break into good small chunks. So I think I'll just accept this day's lecture being a bit short and the next lecture being a bit long. I was thinking of maybe starting this like chapter four tonight, but it really doesn't. Uh, the first chunk of it is very long and there's no point doing a little piece of it. So let's start up here. Let me get rid of the extra windows here and make this one big. All right. So this is asset security and here's some topics. So just a moment, I've got a extra window here. I've got a minimize or something, shove it out of the way. All right, that should be better. Okay. So we're going to talk about classifying data, ownership of data and other objects, memory and remnants, and therefore data destruction and data security controls. So classifying data is necessary in any kind of mandatory access control system and even in some other systems. In the government, they use uh, top secret, secret, confidential, and unclassified as the primary uh, classification levels. Another one is sensitive but unclassified. Uh, these are things that are not national security records, but they're still things that just shouldn't be handed out to everybody, like employee health records. Then there's for official use only and so on. Private sectors can define whatever labels they like, but they typically have something marked proprietary and uh, other things like internal use only. In the military, there is sensitive compartmented information. And this is information that is subject to both vertical and horizontal security controls. The vertical controls 
are the classifications like secret and top secret, and the horizontal controls is need to know. So you are not allowed to see this unless you are cleared for that level of knowledge and you are working in an area related to it and are determined to have a need to know it. So clearance is the formal determination of whether you can be trusted with a specific kind of information, and that's vertical, um, which just means you are not uh, easy to subvert by having some kind of relationship with a uh, foreign national or drug problem or something like that. If you don't have those problems, then you can get cleared to handle high-level information like secret or top secret. And then um, you can get access approval if you meet all the requirements and you have been informed of the consequences if you leak the data. And then you have to have need to know, which is your horizontal need. So if you are uh, cleared for top secret information, but you're not working in Russia, then you probably would not be given need to know for things about Russia. And so it goes. Um, all right. So sensitive media. Uh, you've got media security here, so you're going to have sensitive information. It resides on media. You're going to have to label the media, and you're going to have to consider how you store it and how you handle the backups. Uh, it's handling storage and retention, and eventual discarding and destruction of data all must be covered to make sure that at no point do you lose that information or put it in the wrong category and let it leak out. So you do this by having people who are given the responsibility. The CEO level of the company is the business owner or the mission owner. These are people who have the ownership of the company's large mission. And companies have a large vague mission statement like Google's mission statement is to index all the world's data. So it's directly contrary to privacy and they're often in trouble over that. But they have different companies have different, have a giant goal there. And so from a viewpoint of security, these are people who make the security program and ensure that it's properly staffed and funded and they give assets to their team and they own the mission of making sure that they meet their security goals, which typically are things like protecting our customers from unwarranted uh, intrusions. So underneath them, you have data owners. These are people who own a specific kind of data like our customer database or our product database or our payroll database. And these people now have to determine the labels and determine how that data is handled, how it's backed up, what kind of systems it's put on, or what kind of protections are put on those systems. They do the management to make sure these things are done correctly. And then they have custodians who actually do the work. So custodians are just obeying instructions they got from the data owners. Then there's a system owner who owns a physical computer or a system server or something like that. And they are now responsible for making sure that the, that device is properly maintained with patches and hardware repairs and so on. Uh, again, they probably hand the actual work off to custodians, but they're responsible to make sure things are done. And the custodian is the person that does the hands-on work on the data and the devices. They do backups, patching, adding antivirus software, uh, specifying groups and access control lists and all these things. They are responsible for doing the work, but they're not responsible for deciding how it should be done very much. They're mostly just following orders that come from above. And then, of course, you have your users who are not directly in any of this chain determining or implementing security safeguards. They have some other job, like selling a product or something, and they have to comply with all the policies and standards that are uh, enforced from above and all the security restrictions that are put on by these other people. So they're told rules like you can't write down passwords and you can't have two people share the same account and so on. And you have to make sure they've been officially informed of all this or you won't be able to punish or fire them if they break these rules. So data controllers uh, are people like human resources that have access to some sensitive data and then they have to um, have the responsibility of making sure that data is not lost or misused. And then there are data processors who again are like the custodians. They are people that do the actual work and often you outsource that. Um, all right. There have been quite a few scandals of outsourcing to insecure places. Uh, Kaiser, a medical company out here, outsourced their data entry to an American company who without Kaiser's knowledge outsourced it to a Pakistani company and then didn't pay those workers. And Kaiser got emails from people in Pakistan saying, give me my $10 or I'm gonna dump your data on the internet. 
and the Kaiser officials are saying, what is our data doing in Pakistan anyway? Who is this person? And this is a problem. And if you do outsource someone and they do something terrible with your data, as we talked about last time, you're still responsible for that. They say it was your data, you handed it to some lunatic who did something stupid, and then you failed to review what they were doing to find out that they were doing something terrible, so you're still responsible. Anyway, uh, one wise policy is to not collect any data you don't need. This will save you a lot of suffering in the long run. Then you don't have a big database you have to protect. And I've got a few cahoots about this stuff. Bring them up. All right. And they are here. And there it is. Let's make sure the settings are right. Yeah, they're right. Okay, good. All right. They've got new music. Oh, for Halloween, I see. And a couple more people ought to join. Ah, here comes another good. We, I got him. I've got I am. Perhaps that's Jim. Let's see if KT is coming. Another 10. Ah, oh, there you go. Good. Oh, now we got everybody. Good. Okay. So, four questions. All right. What data requires need to know in addition to clearance? All right, that's the sensitive compartmented information. Not a popular answer, but that's what it is. All right. Who puts on the patches? That's the custodian. We are currently living through a big storm about who should have put on the patches at Equifax. And it is certainly true that a custodian should have done it, but a manager should have managed it. Anyway. All right. So who is the manager responsible for those security patches? Hmm. Yeah, well, I thought it might be the data owner. System owner is not a bad answer either, really. So I'm, I'm thinking this might not have been a brilliant answer. System owner, certainly you could argue for that too. System or data owner both have a stake in making sure the system is properly patched. All right. So what are HR people? That's it, they are data controllers. Okay, good. All right. So let's carry on. So, uh, memory and remnants, uh, this is a big issue. Uh, people have become more and more aware of it in recent years, that all your computerized equipment leaves data on it as you discard it, and uh, this is a problem. It's on your hard drives, it's on your flash drives, it's on your Xerox machines, all your devices have data on them, and if you don't erase it very carefully, then when you discard or donate that, you lose data. So, uh, there are a lot of things that do not retain data for any significant amount of time, like RAM and the other memory in your computer, the cache memory and the registers. These are only intended to hold data while the power is on. And when you turn off the power, they forget relatively quickly. Although RAM can have data last for a few minutes, especially if it's cold, 
but these other things typically fade in less than a second. So they call it volatile, like a chemical that evaporates. This is data that vanishes after the power goes off. The cold boot attack is one attack against a whole disk encryption like BitLocker. If you get the machine in a sleep state where it has already decrypted the hard drive and put the um, key in RAM, you can pull up, freeze the RAM chip and pull it out and put it in another computer. If you freeze it, it will retain data for perhaps 10 minutes without power. So you have enough time to put it in another computer and steal the data. That's the cold boot attack. ROM, by the way, is not volatile. That's like a CD ROM or a silicon chip ROM. You burn data in and that data stays in there forever without any power. It's a permanent change in the structure of the chip. Then there's uh, various kinds of random access memory, all of which is volatile. Uh, static RAM is fast and expensive. Dynamic RAM is slower and cheaper. Computers can have both. And then there's firmware, uh, like the ROM chips and the firmware in the router that is stored someplace so it is not lost when the power goes off. Uh, and you don't change this stuff very often. It mostly just uh, persists and you use the same firmware reboot after reboot. So PROM is the kind of read-only memory you can write only once. So if you want to upgrade the ROM, you have to pull out the chip and throw it away and replace it with a new chip. And that these days, more common is the programmable logic devices that can be erased and rewritten, like EEPROM that can be erased, and EEPROM that can be electrically erased, and flash memory, like the USB sticks everyone gets. They remember fine with no power, and they can be erased and reused. So flash memory is EEPROM. Oops, got an extra O there. It's not prum. All right. And um, so you write it sector by sector, not byte by byte, which is also true of disks. Hard disks, you write them in 512 byte sectors, um, and they're in between EEPROMs and magnetic disks in speed. Solid state drives are all the rage. They're expensive, but much faster than hard drives. They make computers lighter and use less power. So they're used in cell phones and thin laptops. They use large data block sizes, and you can only erase an entire block all at once. So uh, erasing is also a slow process. So to make performance better, they usually have a garbage collection process happening in the background, which tries to find blocks that are mostly empty and move the data around to make a completely empty block and then erase it while you're not doing anything else. So that when it comes time to store some fresh data, there's an empty block there ready for it. This means that leftover data is largely automatically erased on these machines, but you can't count on that because not all systems permit the garbage collection process to happen, and the garbage collection process does not get all the data. It just gets the data that in its wisdom is on a block that can be emptied out. Some data is left behind and not picked up by the garbage collection. Uh, in addition, if you buy an SSD, like a 500 gigabyte SSD, they actually give you some extra data on there. You have some larger number, like 510 gigabytes, and the extra areas are used to substitute when there are read errors in blocks. So if you use it for a while and then wipe out the data, some of the data you saved is in somewhat damaged blocks over on the side, not used anymore, and when you try to erase it, you cannot erase those blocks. And even though they failed a test for accuracy, it doesn't mean that all the data is 100% gone on them. So you have data that you cannot erase left over in extra blocks on the SSD. So it is uh, not simple to clean data off an SSD. So if you need to get rid of an SSD, there are two ways to securely erase it. Uh, you have to physically destroy it, just grind it up. That's the most secure way. And another way that works very well is what iPhones do. The encryption is turned on before you ever get the device. So all the data you've been writing from the very beginning was encrypted. So even data that is stuck in a bad block is encrypted. And then when you decide to erase it, all you do is erase the key. So if you go to iPhones, you go into your settings and you say, clean my device so I can sell it. That process is essentially perfect, and it has been tested by researchers that have bought 100 used iPhones off eBay and hunt through them, and they were unable to recover any personal data off any of them. It's very effective in practice, but it only works if you have the encryption turned on before you ever start using it, 
so that none of the data you put in gets stored in an unencrypted way. All right, and then there's data destruction. When you're done with data, um, you can just physically grind up the hard drive or the flash drive, and that's very easy to understand how that should work. Um, you, if you deliberately delete a file by dragging it in the trash can, that doesn't erase the contents at all. Uh, you have to write on top of the sectors. Now, this is called shredding or wiping. If you write all over a magnetic hard drive, that erases all the data, although it's not going to be on your CISSP exam because it's not commonly known, but I talked to Travis Goodspeed, who's a researcher in this area, and he told me that all physical hard drives bigger than 500 gigabytes work like the SSDs. They have extra sectors that are invisibly mapped in to replace sectors that turn bad, and he was, said he was able to recover 50 megabytes of latent data off a forensically erased one, gigabyte, one terabyte uh, hard drive. So they have a similar issue of a small amount of data potentially being left on them even when you think you've erased them, but that is not commonly known. And I, he hasn't written a publication about it. I kept wanting to cite it, but he hasn't written it up yet to my knowledge. Degaussing is another technique that was used. Uh, I don't hear of it that much these days, but it used to be used on floppy disks and tape drives and in principal magnetic drives too. If you can get a very strong magnetic field, you can just physically scramble the uh, magnetic elements in there. Um, I don't know how you would really be sure if this has been done well enough. It seems to me like physically destroying the drive is probably a lot safer procedure, but in principle, if correctly done, degaussing could be all right for a magnetic medium. Physically destruction is usually the best answer because, because of Moore's law, old used computer equipment is almost worthless anyway, so it really isn't costing you much more to just destroy your old hard drives and such as opposed to trying to reuse them or donate them. And that's why people typically just physically shred things. All right, I got some more cahoots. Uh, it's just gonna be this one B, all right. And there it comes. Okay, seven five six seven sixty eight. Suppose we have any more customers? Oh, we got five. Maybe I should wait. Someone has appeared. We'll see if they join the coot. We could get up to four here. Looks like Jeffrey has appeared. I'll wait a few seconds to see if he's joining up. Well, I think I'll carry on and he can join if he wants to. All right, let me get this out of the way. Okay, four questions. All right, which component retains data longer when cooled? Okay, RAM, ROM retains data forever, whether it's cooled or not. RAM is what retains data longer when you cool it. Instead of vanishing in just a few seconds, it might last as long, as, long as 10 minutes. <coughs> Pardon me. All right, which device can only be written once? That's prom, it's read-only memory, you can only write once, and then it's read-only after that point. Uh, RAM, you can write too many times, either dynamic or static RAM, you can read and write many times. All right, which device performs garbage collection?
<coughs> yep, that's SSDs. All right. All right, you're discarding an unencrypted SSD. How should you clean the data off? Okay, we're all over the place. The only thing safe is physical destruction. Degaussing does nothing because it's not a magnetic routine, and shredding doesn't work. That's writing data on top of it because you cannot address all the blocks on an SSD. You can only address some of them. So the only thing you can do if someone has put data on it that was not encrypted is physically grind up the device. All right. So we're down to the last section here. I said this will be a little short tonight. So data security controls. Certification is uh, deciding that something meets certain requirements that have been set. As we know, certification exams like the CISSP mean that you have achieved a certain level of knowledge set by somebody. But accreditation means that the data owner accepts your certification and decides that you're good enough to perform the task for them, which may or may not be determined by certification. They may have other criteria that also uh, go into making that decision. There's a lot of standards out there for how to, you should handle data. PCI, DSS, we've talked about before, the payment card industry, uh, data security standard. This is Visa, MasterCard, and other credit card agencies' self-regulation system saying uh, what security controls you must have in order for them to allow you to process credit card transactions. Octave is a, another system developed by Carnegie Mellon University. And the international one is ISO 27000. Um, large bodies and companies and governments often want you to meet this one. It is very expensive. I heard a, a read an article that said it took an average company, I think, a million dollars in four years to achieve ISO 27000 certification. It is a huge bureaucratic investment where you have to have security uh, directors from the top and reports about them, and then a whole bunch of reports at many layers of management saying how the security has been implemented, and uh, something that tests to see how well your security goals are being met, and a feedback system that takes those measurements back to the top and adjusts your security policy to improve compliance with their goals, and a blizzard of paperwork being created by managers at every level documenting that all these things have happened in order to satisfy the ISO 27000 certification. COBIT is another one from ISACA, which is a company, uh, an auditing organization, uh, sort of like the ISC squared that puts out the CISSP test. This ISACA is the auditing group. Uh, ITIL is another one, another framework for IT service management. These are just various uh, standards you could meet as an organization, making sure that you have certain bureaucratic structures in place so that you can meet a security standard and prove that you have put in the work to get there. Now, if you do achieve something like PCI compliance, one of my uh, students got a job and he, his job for about a year was to make his company PCI compliant, and I heard quite a bit about it. It is not as straightforward as, say, us taking the CISSP exam, where we all take exactly the same exam. It's more like making some kind of settlement with a legal team. The PCI may require 10 things, but you don't really have to do all 10 things. You either have to do all 10 things or you have to explain why some of them don't apply to you or why some of them are unreasonable in your circumstances and so on. So the first thing you do is you decide what portions of the standard actually apply to you. They might have things there that don't matter, like they might have rules like wireless applying to equipment that you don't use. And then there's tailoring, which determines how you're going to do it and you might decide, for example, rather than meeting an onerous uh, requirement, you would rather just modify your business practices to avoid that issue. All right, uh, so for data security controls, you have to protect data in motion and data at rest. Drive and tape encryption is the kind you hear about most, hard drive encryption like BitLocker. And the point of this is if someone is going to steal the entire storage medium, like stealing your laptop on an airplane, which certainly happens a lot, then you're going to wish the whole drive was encrypted so the data at rest is stored. Otherwise, a lost laptop is going to be a breach, and you'll have to go through breach notification processes to comply with legal regulations. 
Uh, if you have backup data, it should be stored off-site. You certainly need backups and you need them off-site because your whole building could burn down. So now you have to worry about that as a possible leak. Uh, what's recommended is to use a company like, say, Iron Mountain, a company that takes your backups and puts them in a secure transportation like an armored truck, drives them someplace and locks them in a safe. That would be a good thing to do. Or an online backup solution that sends them encrypted over the Internet. Uh, a lot of people have informal practices like handing the data to one of your employees to just drive home and, and frequently those things get stolen and you're sorry you had an informal process instead of paying more to get a, a strong process. And data in motion, while it's traveling over a network, is clearly at risk and it should be encrypted end to end with something like a virtual private network or HTTPS so that anybody who steals the data in the middle will not be able to read it. And we're down to the last batch of cahoots. Let me see how much time I have left here um, before this thing hangs up on me. I can't see. Well, I think we'll be all right. Um, I think it would warn me if I was out of time. We'll just try the cahoots and see if they work, which is this one here. All right. And this one. All right. I'll wait another 10 seconds and then we'll go. Ah, here's three people. All right, I'll wait a few more seconds to see if we get the fourth person. All right, apparently not. Okay, four questions. What's the international standard? All right, that's the ISO standard. Good. All right. Which one comes from ISACA? That's COVID, good. All right. What's the process that determines what portions of a standard your organization will use? That's scoping. The part that you don't use is considered out of scope. All right, what do you have to do after breach? All right, obviously you have to notify government agencies, your customers, your legal team, and things like that there, and it'll depend on your state and country what you have to do. All right. Well, I think that's it for tonight. I say this class is a bit short. It'll be longer next time. The chapter four portion quiz is up. You can do that. And uh, got any questions, let me know. You can send me a chat or email me or reach me on Twitter. I think I'm going to stop this unless anybody pops anything up in the next few seconds. Here comes something. Just saying, awesome, thanks. Okay, good, all right. Yes, well, all right. I'll see you a week from today, six o'clock next Friday, California time. Have a good weekend. Okay, bye. End meeting.